big churches. Um, I had my communion congregation. I took when I was third. I went through a whole year of uh, adult education classes. Uh, and on the Easter Vigil, that's where they allow you to be fully vested into the church. You can speak, you know, communion and all of that stuff. Well, as time goes on with the big church, you start to feel there's 10,000 people in the church. There's no informal, uh, just a number. That's how I felt anyway. And I think this October, seven years, when I found this church, with my friend Godfrey, you remember Godfrey. He said, you gotta come and meet this church. I said, oh, where, where are we going? Where's the church? He said, oh, it's downstairs at Banders. Banders? What is this, some kind of a hippie movement? I thought, <laughs> oh, God, this, uh, this is going to be something way out of the ordinary. During that first day I was there, I met a lot of, some of you, some people that are not here anymore. But I sat there and I felt very comfortable. I listened to what everybody had to say. I talked to people. But at the end, what really touched me, and a little Irishman came up to me, put his hand on my heart, started praying for me, and gave me the biggest hug and tried to pick me up. <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know if he got me off the ground. I wasn't. I don't think so. I don't think so. But it just meant a lot to me, and I walked out of that basement dance. Thought, wow, something just happened. As so I went on, we started doing the end of the first uh, Thanksgiving drive. This next thing is going to be my second one. Uh, just got so close to so many people over the course of the seven years. It just it smelled a lot, it touches my heart every day. A lot of people that I talk to, I cry with a lot of people, a lot of people know my story. Uh, I know a lot of other people's story. It just feels like one big family. Mm -hmm. And that is really what it should be. You shouldn't feel like just another person sitting in the pew, standing up, kneeling down, standing up. You just don't have that in the big church. Now I know I'll probably feel guilty to be heading up in the big church, but I'm not going to be heading up. Just, you're not you just in, you're out, you drop your money off, and you go. But I thank you and you all for being part of my life. Because without this church, I don't think I have the faith that I have today.
morning. Good morning. Good morning. Don't be nervous. You may see it burning. and crossover have transformed us. Our journey with crossover began November 24th, 2013. And yeah, six years, but it feels like we've been here forever. It's like Brian, like you said, it's, it's a family, it's support, it's love. Um, this is our story. Back in 2015, Joe and I went through a separation. We were proceeding through a divorce. And our family, our kids, no one could get us back together. Our church family was by our side the whole time. And we were listening. God's words were being spoken near crossover. And uh, I think once we were able to get out of our own way, the Holy Spirit came into Joe and I, and what God has united, no man should divide. We actually lived in the same house on different levels for quite a period of time, and there's actually no word spoken. And our reunion, like a child's birth, took place after nine months. That's when we were able to get back together. Through, again, as Grace said, there was nobody here who, or that we knew that could help us. And it was an intervention through Jesus who um, finally spoke through our daughter and made us see the light and what he wanted from us. And it was instantaneously that our lives changed. And we said, this is not what God wants. And again, for the support of everyone in this church as well, you guys were great, and there was a lot of support here. We thank you for that. But for grace to continue that way. Yeah, well, we listened, we surrendered, and we pray. Um, two years after Joe and I were together, an unthinkable tragedy happened. My beloved son, Joe passed away. The last day I saw him was on my birthday, which was a Thursday. By Sunday, he had passed into God's kingdom. There were no goodbyes. Our souls could have slowly died that day, if not also our lives. We both agree from grief. But we listen to the words being spoken here for us over. We knew we were entitled to joy, and God not want us to be consumed by grief. So we listened, we surrendered, and we prayed. No now. Our lives are filled with joy. After that, an amen, because it, it is, we are able to find joy in, in such tragedy. Just knowing that our son is at home where he belongs with his father, and that's what, it's a circle that goes completely around, and it goes around every day, and at the end of the circle, we know he's in the right place. <laughs> From there, my mother was consumed with her own grief. So five weeks after our son passed, she had said some offensive words to Joe and I, that, and we were completely offended. We did talk to my mother, my brother, and my stepfather close to two years. Forgiveness. Who likes that word? It's tough. It's tough in the flesh, but not in God's kingdom. Isaiah has preached the words of Matthew 18, 21 through 22. 
Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I can forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. I just had one act of forgiveness. We both had one act of forgiveness and we knew what we were called upon. So we listened, we surrendered, and prayed. We had to work through our offense to realize mom didn't know any better. Our family has since had a reconciliation and the joy of family has been restored. Lastly, moving on to work. <coughs> Joe and I are partners in several different fairy businesses. Yeah, we're married. We <laughs> are together. <laughs> yeah. That's a business. <laughs> uh, this can come with some challenges, but we have surrendered those challenges and stresses of running multiple businesses to God, and we have peace. We have listened to the sermons, participated in the small groups, fellowshiped with our church members, so being a part of Corso and the Holy Kingdom has transformed us. And we will close in prayer, and just Lord, as we celebrate the nine year anniversary of Crossover, continue to bless our church, our pastor, our elders, and each and every member here for good health, peace, joy, increase, and hope according to your will. Amen. I'm just going to add one more thing. This is uh, real quick, but uh, I was, um, I accepted Jesus back in the late 70s uh, through a very close friend of mine who were in the service together. And, uh, We've gone through our ups and downs, but um, there was a point in time we were both Christians. There was a point in time there was an airport next to the public called Zons Airport. You may remember that. And um, we were coming in for a landing, and the two airports had almost overlapping runways and takeoff uh, situations where they overlapped. And for whatever reason, we had a discrepancy in our instruments we both had turned off our headsets, turned them down so we could speak together. And within a split second, we had overextended our approach. And coming out of Republic was a citation jet coming directly towards us. And we, we saw the rivets on the wing before we turned up our sets and we turned them up. The tower was basically screaming, and all we could say was, thank you, Jesus. He gave us a second chance at life. So we've been blessed uh, in so many ways, and uh, we're so grateful to be part of Crossover Church, and we just uh, wanted to share some of the things we've gone through, and whoever thinks it's difficult here, um, Jesus is with you. He is with you, and whenever you have your doubts, just look up, talk to him, and guaranteed he'll be with you. And he's the same. Amen.
honestly feel that everyone that comes through those doors is called here through Jesus because there's so much love here. So when I was coming, I was coming by myself with my daughter and she helped us start the children's ministry and you know, friends would say, I'm going to church at my house. I was like, okay, the church of Freddie's bed. <laughs> <laughs>
As we pulled in, Sean pointed at a tree in the front yard and said, wow, what a beautiful tree. We're buying this house. We hadn't even gotten out of the car. Unbeknownst to me, which I quickly learned, the tree was a beautiful 75-year-old cut leaf maple. With its bare branches and trapped in the weight of the snow, Sean knew its value. So we did. We bought the house. It was a joke between the two of us that we had bought the house because of the tree. And what a lovely tree it was indeed. We will come back to the tree. When Nicholas was three years old, we quickly learned that he had not met some of his developmental milestones. After several evaluations, we learned that Nick had sensory integration issues and was probably on the autism spectrum. The internet was just beginning, there was little information available, and, so, and the so-called professionals characterized it as a life of struggle and doom and gloom. I called upon God to help me to understand and to help me navigate this world of the unknown. And God heard my prayers. I poured over books, I read whatever I could get my hands on, I spoke to whomever I could that had more knowledge than I on this subject. I learned quickly and forged ahead. I refused to believe that my child, this wonderful gift from God, who is so bright and so loved, would be doomed to a life of failure. When Nick entered kindergarten, the special education administrator, Dr. Grossman, decided that Nick needed to be placed in a self-contained class with other children with specialized needs. I was not entirely convinced that this would be the right placement for him, but I trusted the professionals. It was an awful school year. At the end of kindergarten, the school district redistricted us, and for first grade, Nick was again placed into a self-contained class in a different school with the same awful teacher. At the end of first grade, Nick had not gotten the reading, writing, and math needed to move on to second grade. But the school district, in their infinite wisdom, declared that Nick would be moving on to second grade, remain in a self-contained class, and would be moved to yet another school in the district. I said no. I wanted him left back to first grade and placed in an inclusion class with supports in place to help him be successful in a regular class setting with good role models to emulate. At that meeting, the head of special education, Dr. Grossman, said to me, Mrs. McMahon, you need to lower your expectations. This child will never go to college. Now I know God was with me in that very moment because I know he held me back from climbing across the table and straight <laughs> this administrator, a doctor of education. I looked him dead in the eye and I said, how dare you, how dare you make that determination at six years old and do my child to a life of failure. I pulled Nick out of the public school system, placed him into a very expensive private school with all the supports in place for him, and then sued the school district for the very expensive tuition. I won. They appealed, and I won again. <laughs> Winning one of the largest judgments against the school district, and and forcing the school district to provide our special needs children with inclusion classes at the lower elementary level in our district. It was a struggle to get the district to release the funds to the private school after winning, and the private school was after me for payment. I certainly did not have the money sitting in my bank account. So now, remember the train? One Saturday morning, in the dead of winter, as I sat at my kitchen table praying, asking God to help me, how would I pay this tuition? There was a knock at my front door. I opened the door, and there stood a well-dressed man who introduced himself as a tree broker. He pointed to the beautiful tree, the bare-leafed, cut-leaf maple on my front lawn, and said, that tree, it's a beautiful tree. I've been driving by and watching it. Do you want to sell it? 
I was flabbergasted, but without hesitation I said, sure. He asked me how much I wanted for it, and without thinking or hesitation, I blurted out the amount I had prayed for to cover Nick's tuition and expenses. He responded with, sold. God not only heard my prayers, he held my hand and answered. Nick went on to graduate from high school with a Regents diploma, being chosen as homecoming king, and voted by his peers as the kid that would be most remembered. In conclusion, as the church knows, Nick was in a horrific accident which nearly took his life. In the darkest hours, on my knees, begging God for the life of my precious child, and screaming at the devil, telling him he can't have him, God spoke to me. Chris Kelly was one of the first people I called. God led me. I have never questioned God lead, God's lead or intention. God brought me to the Crossover Christian Church for a reason. My boy needed your prayers, and God was listening. Chris never hesitated. He and Lisey were there every moment, every minute, and never wavered. You, the church, prayed for my boy. I recall clearly the day Nick was in surgery for 10 hours to reconstruct his face that had been so badly broken, his future uncertain. God spoke to me and said, never a victim, always victorious. Amen. And it continues on his journey, finishing Southern Community College with a 3.8 for the semester. Yeah. On the yeah. And a 3.2 overall GPA. He has applied and has been accepted to one of the best colleges in the country, Clemson University. We love you guys as a family. Bless you. What a blessing. Well done, Denise. <laughs>
part of the, the fabric, um, week in, week out, prayers, whatever is needed. You got something to say, go? Yes, you do. Okay. We are the little church that could. Yeah. <laughs> And then there's others that they've built up and then 
they become the prayer warriors. And again, it's just foundational and it just keeps on going. We need prayer, we need prayer for your loved ones. These are all the things that they provide for us. And again, the foundation of the word. It's always the word. We come back to the word. We honor God. We come back to the word. It's just beautiful. Amen. Um, so slide two. There we are. The Lord has done great things for us. And we're filled with joy. We just spoke about the joy. So I just want to say, can we stand? Show some love for our Christmas. And say thank you so much. This is a beautiful place to be. We ask God to just bless this house. Every family, every individual. That you would grow in. That we grow together. And again, that lives are changed in this area. Because of this church. And of course, the And of course, the band. She's gone through so much for the mom and dad, but they, they just stand firm in foundation. So we just want to say thank you so much. So when you're in corporate America, you're a number. Not all the time, but a lot of times you're a number. And a 
October of 2014, my number was called. It was the best thing, okay? Because I remembered the whole year leading up to that day. I was going through a lot of stuff in that corporate world. And I remember God saying to me, stay the course, I got this. Where literally, I was being pulled, I was getting recruited, people were like offering me more money to do the same job at a different company, but I knew that I needed to stay the course, so I did, because I heard him. I've heard him since I was a little girl. So I did, I stayed the course. In October 2014, I was downsized, and I remember I got the phone call from my manager, and she said, Stacy, I am so sorry to tell you, but your position is no longer available. And I giggled, and she said, did you just giggle? And I was like, oh, did I giggle out loud? I don't think I realized that I actually giggled. But when I tell you I felt free, I felt free. Because now I can figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up, and this wasn't it. That was a Wednesday. I was in church on that Sunday. And we were here, and every, uh, on the site was, uh, was doing your service. And what was being spoken of was open doors. That God opens up doors every day, all day. But we are so busy doing other things that we miss it. On our phones, which we all can attend to be on our phones a lot, we are busy doing other things than paying attention to those doors that he's opening up for us all the time. And I remember leaving church that night praying and thinking, listen, whatever door you're about to open, put like flashing lights on it, <laughs> make bells or something, make it so big that I don't miss it because I knew something was coming. I knew something was coming. Well then, that week I got invited to a friend's wine and wellness event, and that Friday, so just 10 days after the day I was downsized, I was introduced to the health and wellness world, where I learned about the Juice Plus company and the Juice Plus products. I became a certified holistic health coach, and I literally got praises me every day for choosing the path that he wanted. Because that's what I wanted too. Because the impact that I knew I wanted in my life wasn't what I was doing, but I was stuck. You ever been stuck? And you settle, right? I call the F word, the fine. You're fine. Being fine means that you are where you are and you're not gonna push yourself to where you have to go. No expectations are really low. I was fine for a really long time. And I was downsized. And that fine became extraordinary. I stepped into my magic because I trusted, I followed, and here we are. So 4.30 in the morning, <laughs> 10 weeks ago, I get a call from my mom. Madison has a huge tumor on her brain stem. We don't know what's going on. I hung up the phone and I called this man probably 30 times <laughs> until she answered. <laughs> I bet you're too bad. <laughs> no coffee. But that was my first call, and my second, and my third, because I knew that this wasn't something I could do alone. And that's where she stepped in. That's where you stepped in. That's where all of you have stepped in. So when you think about church, don't think about words or some kind of prayer that has to be in some kind of format. Think about us. Think about us, what we can do together. You are not alone. We are here together. And my family, my sister's family, doesn't understand God like I know God. And I am so grateful that I know God because I know God for myself. I know God through her eyes, through her prayers. And together we are gonna heal Madison that doesn't happen without me. So I'm proud to be here. I was meant to be here with you, with all of you. And I'm grateful every single day. Amen. Wow. And those are just half a dozen stories, eh? Hey? Aren't we incredibly blessed? There's a story in every single one of your lives. A story in the making. Um, I, I know that we, we're going to wrap up in a minute, but wasn't this wonderful today? Yeah, yeah. So I, I know Jamie Jules wants to say something. He's going to have like two minutes. Um, I, I. You don't want to say anything. I'm sorry. I want to say something about him. I'm going to put a song in your guy's head. You know that song that says, this is my fight song. Yeah. This is my life song. 
the legacy I hope to lead is Carosa. A legacy that I hope goes out as a point of light from now right into eternity. I love the stories that have been shared here today. Each one of you that shared, I know a story of you before you got to where you got to. And I love how God brings the wholeness, a fullness, and the completeness to life. And our, our mandate is one where we're to pass that hope, that love, that peace, and that joy to another. That is that mandate. Um, so it is, it's really very, very humble to actually be called one of the leaders. Because I never really truly feel like a leader. But at the end of the day, you have to actually answer the call. And if that's what I have to answer, you're stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> It's a tremendous privilege to partner in ministry with the love of my life. It's a tremendous privilege for us to serve and to share life together with all of you. I want you to look around. I do have a vision for this church. And we are the seedbed and the foundation. I have a vision for a kingdom church that is whole, that is reaching many for Jesus Christ, not only in this nation, but across the world. I will hold that vision until God brings it into fullness. We are the beginning. We are not the end. I celebrate every single one of you, but go out and find the people that need the love of Jesus. Bring them in. And let's see what God does, right? Um, Stacy used the word expectation. And it's a prayer that I often pray from Isaiah 54, 54. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out to the right and to the left because of what God is going to do. So I want to encourage you for your own life and for the life of this church that you begin to step out in faith and ask God for more than what you currently have because there's a whole lot that is waiting to pour out on you. Can I pray a blessing? But before you start, pray and bless. Everybody you have is called. I want to remind you, you have a voice and it counts. So write it down. Be part of the song. Amen? Be part of the song. Stacey, I was just reminded with your testimony that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things you don't see. Because we do, we speak forth into the life of mass. Amen. We yes. will not wait. We will not flinch. We will not turn around until we'll we see the fullness of what God's hand will be upon us. And in it, I may believe that every life that comes forth into contact with Madison will know the divine touch of God. Hallelujah. Because where there is God, where he is present, he brings life. And in it, he brings hope. He brings love. He brings peace. And he brings joy. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just finally, one, one bit of church family news. Uh, many of you know Ronnie Van der Hoof. Two years ago and today, she lost her husband, Tom. Uh, her brother-in-law, not Bobby Van der Hoof, but another brother-in-law passed away this week. So the funeral is on Monday. It's very close. It's very painful. For those of you who do know Ronnie, I'd encourage you to put in a call, send a card, I can give you um, the contact details. 
Won't you stand and I'm going to speak a blessing on you and I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who shared. Um, you fed us on so many levels. Such a blessing. So the prayer that I want to pray over you is really from Ephesians 3. And my prayer is that God would strengthen you with might in your inner man. That God would fill you with all the fullness of God. That you would come into such a revelation and experience of the immeasurable, unfathomable, limitless love of God. That you would be washed with the love of God by the Spirit of God. And that you would go out empowered in the fullness of God, empowered in the love of God to live for His glory in all that you do. And so, Holy Spirit, that you would come to fill the people of crossover. Lord, that you would come to regenerate, that you, Spirit of God, would breathe the very life of God into the fabric of our lives and use us up for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well done.